Welcome to the Lazy Actor Podcast with your host, Yvonne Juanez Ruiz. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Lazy Actor. Gang, this conversation that you're about to hear ended up going over two hours because Edie Inkstetter is not only a super successful actor, she's got so much experience in the casting room and we just had so many things to talk about. So this is going to be part one of part two of a special two-parter with Edie Inkstetter. Big thank you to RadioRadio.com. Remember, if you guys need any podcast help, you want to look into producing podcasts or a commercial or voice work, check them out, RadioRadio.com. And if you ever want to come to the virtual actors practice or an in-person actors practice in Toronto, check out the actorsplace.org. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot my own website. Gang, enjoy this conversation with Edie Inkstead. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Lazy Actor, the podcast that goes through the great acting books in history, takes out all the key knowledge and all the key learning so you don't have to because you're too busy trying to figure out how NFTs work. My guest today is, I want to say powerhouse. I want to say, <laughs> um, uh, I want to say the booking queen. Ladies and gentlemen, Edie Inkstetter is an actor extraordinaire. According to IMDb, Uh-oh. been acting for 21 years. Oh, that's so way your too long. first credit was <laughs> Outside Girl, Outside Girl in the Gavin Crawford show. Edie, welcome to The Lazy Actor. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm very good, Ivan. How are you? That was um, not my first credit. No? I am no. wrong again. That happened last I was... time. Oh, really? I think they just have them in the wrong order, maybe. What's your... Okay, so it says here, but what, do you, it was, what do you think is your first credit? It was the Diane Keaton movie, and it was called... Oh, no, I don't know what it was called. I got Phantom of the Megaplex, and you were... Oh, that was my first one. That was oh, my okay. first one. Phantom I was a cowgirl. I was a cowgirl in a truck and I was complaining to my boyfriend about being hungry or something. And when I finally saw it, they had dubbed my voice with someone oh. else's voice. And every time I said my lines, I was looking away from the camera so you could just see like the side of my face, but not enough that you could really see my mouth moving. And I had was dubbed with a really whiny, high pitched voice. That's hilarious. They, it's they kind of devastating. Vader. They did a Darth Vader on you. <laughs> they did that to Darth Vader. Oh yeah, the guy who the guy who played Darth Vader is not the voice of Darth Vader. The guy, the person in the outfit is not the voice. No, that the voice is James Earl Jones. And there's a whole thing behind. There's a whole like this is Star Wars people are losing their minds that you don't know this. I'm not even a Star Wars person, and I, I know I this. am a Star Wars person. What? How do you know? I not? am a okay. Star Wars person. Well, okay, I'm not a Star Wars, like, insane person, but I have seen most of them, and... Um, but, okay, so the guy who did it apparently had a Cockney accent, and so he was like, Luke, oh, I am your father. That was, I bad. think that was more Australian. That's, that's, my, that's a terrible... That's a little bit of both. How's your British? How's your British? My... Um, I... If, that depends on whether or not you're going to ask me to do say, it right say, Luke, say, Luke, I'm your father and you're best British. I need my kid for this. They do them so well. She does really good Australian. No, I can't. I can't. I might lose a job <laughs> in the future if I try Nobody's to do a British to this. accent. we got like three listeners. You're fine. Don't worry. I no, have your kidding. Irish Australian in my head and I can't get rid and of you it. You can't get it out of your head? <laughs> so, Edie, as you know, in this podcast, what we do is we kind of, we've been going through Audition by Michael Shirtleff. And the reason we are doing this book is when I first started acting, like when I first started my acting journey, you know, I left a career in pharmaceutical sales. I did not know that. Yeah, I know. And uh, this, I I went to the library and this is the first book I ever read on acting. I have that book. Acting class. Yeah. I can't find it. You can't find it? I'll send you. I went through. No, I have it. I have it. It might be in a box because I did just move back up here. Well, just prior to lockdown so a year and a half ago but you know things are still in boxes so it might be in a box but i did go through all my bookshelves i found a lot of um books on auditioning but not that one yeah well this has been for many people like this was my bible for the longest time not just for auditioning but for acting in general yeah and going back into it there's been a couple of things that have been popping up and there's a few things i'm going to bring up okay we're going to jump right into it okay okay get, get right into it uh the we're on page 175 for the audience who's keeping along 
And the section is actors should react on the line, not in between them. Oh, that. Okay. So yes. it says here, in life, we are reacting with what we say while we say it. We don't separate our words and our feelings. Only actors do that. Most actors do it like this. React with the lines, not separate. Do it like life, he says. Do it like life. React with the lines, not separate from them. What do you think? Do you see that a lot? <laughs> Sorry, that was for me everyone, trying for everyone to do who's it. Listening, I think Edie just had a stroke. She's like, what, what, what's happening right now? What do you want from me? <laughs> I you, was, but you were I was, talking before we started recording, just everything, giving us gold. The, no, the, I was attempting. You got stage fright? You got stage fright? No. No, I was attempting to do the reacting after your line thing. Oh, bravo, you, bravo. You went, so you went meta, you went meta. And then so I, I was doing, that. I was doing the meta thing where reaction. now that you've said it all, now I react because while you were talking, I was realizing. So that is one of probably the biggest things for film acting, I think. That is, is one of the biggest things is not, is listening while, and reacting while your scene partner. And in auditions, it's even more important because in an audition, the camera is on you while your scene partner is talking. Um, when you're on set, it quite often isn't. I mean, it is, but they don't, they don't, then they cut it later and it's not. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important things. And I know I'm guilty of this. And when I remember, when he said this, this struck a chord because I remember so often in between lines, I would need like a second or two to kind of like, give my look and then say my line. Yeah, he talks about it, that, how actors, like they always want to have that nice pause in between every single line. And as a result, the scenes just really just stagger. It, it really kills the scene. Yeah, it just slows it right down. And um, whenever I'm telling an actor to pick up the pace, I have to be careful to say cues because it's not about talking faster. If you want to think while you're speaking, that makes sense as well in the same in the same context that you're thinking while the other person is speaking as well. But the the truck driving through a scene between every line will definitely kill it. And I should let the audience know, um, Edie is not only just a very accomplished actor. I mean, we're going to talk about it, but like if you're a, a fan of The Handmaid's Tale, you've learned to hate Edie, you know, because <laughs> of her viciousness. Don't let the for anyone who's watching on YouTube, make sure you check it out. She looks, she's this beautiful woman uh, with this gorgeous like thousand dollar smile. And it's just, the, I hated you in that show. I was like, yeah, beat her up, beat her up. They um, started it. They started it. But <laughs> Edie also has experience in, in the casting room behind the camera. So yes. she's had an opportunity to really sit in and see a lot of actors auditioning and really has, for years, I think you've, you've been on both sides of the camera. So she brings a very unique perspective. And is that still something you see to this day? These actors like big, long gaps between lines? I do see it with- What do you tell them to do then? What do you do? to stop doing that i say stop doing that do you, you know that thing you know that thing you're doing don't do that anymore you know me i say it really nicely you, well i was gonna say because i've been in the room with you and you've never been that mean i say you so, need to pick up your cues and tighten up the scene a bit like yeah. it's just dragging a little bit slowly right now so instead of react exactly that instead of reacting after the line you should be reacting and listening on the line yeah. Um, and yes, I have been in the room quite a bit as a reader, but as you know, I also have run the sessions a lot. And so I end up doing the directing within the room as well. And this is something that a lot of actors, I personally think, okay, so one of the, one of the, the traps that I think I fell into is always thinking that you're the center of the scene. And I know some people, every part's important, but the whole, but especially in film and television, the way I always see it is, it's not about my line. It's about getting from the beginning of the scene to the end of the scene. And the best way I can facilitate that is just by getting it out there. Not like having a dramatic moment so the camera can stay on me longer. Uh, yes, there is truth to that. But at the same time, it has to be about you because you're you. That's like your life is about you. You're always the star of your story. Bravo, bravo. Yeah, I mean, I did, I said to Michael um, Cudlitz when we were on Clarice, I said, I know the show is not about us, but I said, for me, it's about us. And he said, oh yeah, totally. Like, because it is, I mean, Clarice was about my relationship with my husband and my alcoholism and, you know, those struggles. It wasn't about whatever was happening with the FBI and, you know, the dead women they were finding and the, that story. That, it and wasn't I about also, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I actually said to my brother, and it's not horror. 
because my family is like, you do so much horror, we can't watch it. I said, and it's not horror. And he said, it's literally based on the Silence of the Lambs. And I was like, right, my part's not horror. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think of Silence of the Lambs as a horror movie. I don't know why people call it a horror movie. It depends oh. what you consider horror. It's not a slasher movie. I didn't think, yeah, I just thought of it as a crime novel, but I should tell people that in case you haven't heard, it's on CBS and the show is called Clarice. And I think it's about the early years of Clarice. From the no, story. it's a year after oh, it's a year the after. events of the Silence of the Lambs. So she's pretty messed up. And, and what are you getting in what, that? The character. So, um, Cause you're in a couple of episodes. You're like, what? Yes. You're they, I, think, in it. I am recurring and was hoping to recur a lot more, but I'm not sure that it's <laughs> going to get picked up. Um, I am married to Michael Cudlitz, who's um, best known for The Walking Dead and uh, Band of Brothers. He's an uh, amazing actor, really great guy. He's their number two, so he plays Clarice's boss. And then we have Rebecca Breeds is our number one. That's Clarice. But there's um, it has neither been picked up nor not picked up at this point. It's in, and it's in a weird on, limbo. We're going to touch on this later because this is... I had a whole story this morning and this is, you know, the actor's life is one of uncertainty. Yes. And it's so, we were talking before about maybe getting book, having like a three year, a three year contract for a show. And the idea of like, what you mean like regular commitment for three years? <laughs> I mean, I don't have to like drop everything I'm doing tomorrow and just abandon every job I've ever had and burn every bridge so I can get this one audition. What? It's yeah. amazing. It's a very rare thing. Consistency in acting. Uh, another thing we were talking about before we started, everyone is and this is so funny because it's or this book i feel as if could have been about half the size and he realized i can't make a hundred page book on auditioning so now all the chapters went from being five to six pages to like half a page sections and so that's all he talks about when he talks about actors should react on the line he just says react on the line and then he moves on to accents yeah. Your favorite and my favorite. Let's talk a little bit about ac accents are not usually a good choice. I think and that's called become for. more accurate as the days have gone by. So I think they're never a good choice. There are two situations in which you may want to do an accent. One is if the character has that accent, the casting has told you they have that accent and you know how to do it. That's one. And the other one is if you have a natural accent, um, we have a couple of actors in Toronto who are British or um, there's uh, an Irish uh, girl and they do great American accents. And yeah. if they get, yeah. And if they get an audition for something that it's not specific, what the accent is, I used to put one down of each. I'd say, let's do one in your natural accent and then do one in your American accent. But I mean, the other thing is you get your agent to call casting and say do you want the natural accent here or do they have to do an american you know, i mean we have to do american accents as canadians no matter what anyway. we have to do an american yeah. i always have to do so i've almost defaulted now because so many of the characters i even when they don't say we need an accent they say latin latino <laughs> which is their kind of which yeah. i feel is like their subtle way of saying like give us a little give us a little you know give us a little rico suave in that so I always kind of naturally will have a bit of a tinge when they don't ask specifically. When they ask specifically, I put it on a little bit more. I had to do this audition once, okay? This is back in the day. This is 2011. Okay. And my agent messed up and he gave me two, he had two auditions, he sent me two auditions and he messed up. One of them required an Indian accent and one of them did not. So I, he's like, this one needs an Indian accent. Can you do an Indian accent? And I was like, yeah, I think I can do an Indian accent. So for like you know, four days, five days, I talked to some of my friends, uh, my Indian friends. I really worked on it. I learned a bunch of Punjabi words and I was trying to say Punjabi words. I get into the audition and I'm a professor and I do this really good. I, I'm a professor teaching and I do this Indian accent. And oh my God, these... Um, Myers Branstetter in Vancouver. Beautiful. Yes. Casting director. They're so friendly. They're like I worked for them briefly. Oh, they're great. They're both really mm -hmm. great. If you're listening to this, uh, I love you both. You both. You gave me my first opportunity. You have gave me so many opportunities. I send them chocolates every year. Oh, do you? I think the world of them. Yeah, they are amazing. I worked for them briefly, but I worked in their office. And um, I know. Every, yeah, I knew a lot of the girls. So I yeah. go in there. I go in there. And I do this whole thing. And <laughs> <laughs> Heike's sitting there. She's like, you know, Yvonne, that was really great. I'm just I'm just wondering, oh, why are you doing an Indian accent? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I looked at her and I was like, well, because you, you wanted an Indian accent. She's like, 
no, no, we, we, no, this is just a, a professor. And I was like, oh, she's like, can you do it without the Indian accent? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But because I had trained so hard, I could not get through this accent with putting a little bit of like, well, no, like, I, you know what I mean? I could yeah. have had to, and it ended up destroying, I, I, it, we laughed it off. Like, you know, as an actor in the room, you never be like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just kind of laughed it off. And I said, you know what? Thanks so much. I'll see you next time. And she was like, great. We'll see you next time. <laughs> well, that's actually an interesting story in terms of accents, because when people um, do have to do them, and there are shows where you have to, Fargo yeah. uh, would be one. Um, and, and one of the things I often say is learn it, a really, really strong one, and then don't do it. And it'll Uh-oh. still be there. That's a great tip. Yes. And it'll still I, be there. And it won't sound like you're doing a really strong accent. You've just learned it that way. And so, so ha- had they said it's too strong, we just want a mild one. You would, you would have possibly have booked it. the role. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because here's the, this is what Shirtleft says on it. He says, um, talk in an accent in your everyday life, call up friends and talk to them with the accent so that you get it in your system. But then he says, don't let the accent become so primary that the reading becomes an exercise in the accent. Yes. And I think that's what happens when people have accents is they work so hard on the accent that they forget to deliver the performance of the character. Yes. And that is why when I had a 24 hour turnaround uh, with a Brooklyn accent, I had to say, I can't do that because it was, there was going to be nothing but an accent. And I don't even know how good of an accent it would have been. All right, let's try it. Let's, let's do our best. Uh, Tim, Tim, how's your Brooklyn accent? Brooklyn. Oh, we're going to bring in Tim for a minute and we're going to see which one of us can do the best Brooklyn accent right now. Of the, of the two of you. Uh, of, of the three. No, the three of us. What are you talking about? I can't us. do it. Yes. One. Okay. I'm going to give you the line will be, hold on. The lines okay. will be, where is it? Um, it's better the, if we make up our own yeah, okay, lines. The, the, you want to make up your own? No, I, the, no I'm going to do the same okay. one as right. the line is going to be like, I'm sorry. I can't talk to you right now. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. I can't talk to you right now. All okay. Right? Uh, for our Brooklyn listener, uh, write an angry email and I'll read it online. Okay, just write an angry email. But if We're you sorry. are from Brooklyn and you're listening to this podcast, if you're an actor from Brooklyn and you're listening to this podcast, don't write an email. Send me an MP3 with you doing this line. There you go. Yeah. That's what we'll do. All right, so here we go. So the line is, uh, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. That's yours? Yeah, uh, that was pretty good. Yeah. All right, Tim, let's see what we got. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. Jesus. That's heavy. I can't do it again. Elon. I'm going to copy you. No. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. I can't talk to you right now. Sorry. I can't talk to you right now. That's good. That's, That's a middle of the road. That is. Tim was like a, a bit over big. the top Mine cartoon was, cartoon. There you go, Tim. Mine was a little more so. And you had like enough because you had that hint. And then here's the big walkaway gang, not from Michael Shirtleff, but from the mighty Edie. Uh, get really strong. Do practice the accent like Tim. Are you doing? And then try not to have the accent anymore. Can I just clarify that I did not say like Tim? Okay, yes. <laughs> what I, I was I was suddenly saying, you know, do it over the top and badly like him. <laughs> but then try not to use it. And you know what? That actually really resonates because I'll tell you all something. Uh, when I get into the Latino accent, I can't just like switch. Like, I mean, I could if I needed to in the in a heartbeat, but I like to like ease into it. I can't get rid of it. It takes me like a day or two to get rid of it. Um, because so, I can- yes, sorry. Yeah, and that's so that's talk. what I do is um, when I have to have just a hint of an accent, I will speak Spanish for the day before because then I can't can't help it, but have that little bit, which is it's genius. It's a genius idea. So I got an audition on Saturday due Monday, and then an hour later I got an, another one due ASAP, and that was the accent, the New York accent, and I, I had been working like the accent that we shall not speak of. <laughs> The, I, forgot, I forgot the word Brooklyn in the moment. Um, and so I was trying to work on, on the Brooklyn one. And I had the other one do Monday, but I figured ASAP was sooner than Monday. And I finally was just like, yeah, it's, it was eight pages. And I just, it wasn't going to be good enough. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, that's it. For, for, my, for my listening audience who doesn't know, when I hear that, here's what it means. One, that's not a lot of time to prepare. And that's not uncommon that you'll only have a couple of days. And it's it's the stakes are much higher because that probably means it's quite a large part. It's probably yes. a recurring, it's a guest star. And so there's that extra stress. So that one must've been a super hard choice. And something has happened to make that happen that fast. Like they've yeah. lost an actor for some reason or something. There's, there's, there normally 
They wouldn't do um, it that fast. Yeah, yeah. they give you a week or yeah. something. For sure. um, so I, f I finally went, I just, and the other one was also um, a large number of pages and the last three were almost a full monologue. Um, it, and I thought, okay, no, this, I, I know I'm not going to book it. I'm not, it's not going to be good enough. So I wrote to my agent and I said, really sorry, that accent's not going to happen in the next 24 hours. And I'm going to focus on the Monday one. <laughs> and I couldn't do the Monday one without the accent. No. <laughs> so I went on to my other one that didn't have New York. And I was like, now I have to. <laughs> you booked the one well, you did on Monday. I did manage to, it was due Monday. I did it on Sunday, but um, I did manage to get rid of the accent. But I was like, okay, now I'm stuck in this accent for the audition hey, say, that doesn't say, happen. Say fucking hipsters the accent that's how that's the easiest way to say it say fucking hipsters in the new york accent yeah that's how you do in new york. these fucking hipsters <laughs> fucking hipsters i'll say so. fucking hipsters fucking hipsters these fucking, fucking hipsters, hipsters. Yeah, i want yeah, it so even tim managed to do it there you go what do you mean even tim? <laughs> <laughs> there was a there was a show and i can't remember they just did a montage of new yorkers saying fucking hipsters I'll tell you one thing these fucking hipsters yeah fucking oh they did it was, oh, that, it was see, if I found that, I could have practiced that. I'll send it to you. I do go to YouTube though. Yeah, I do a lot of I do a lot yeah. of accent research. There, on there are a couple of um, there are now, a couple of good people. Before yes. before we go on to the next part with Michael Shirtliff, when because this one is oh, we're leaving the accents. I'm so sad. <laughs> well, I, I do want to mention ask another question of you because this is something that as an actor I have done in the past. I feel it's one of those things that half the people you ask will say good, half the people you ask will say nay. Sometimes they want an accent, and if I don't feel I can sell it, I'll just do the audition without the accent. Yes, that's fine. I'll just say, you know what, fuck it. I'm just going to give a good performance, and you know what, maybe I won't have the best Southern accent, right? Yeah. Or what Milwaukee accent, right? But I'm still going to give them a good performance. Yes, but yeah, absolutely, you should do that. And and the only reason I didn't do that with this one was I. There were a number of reasons I didn't feel like I was oh, going to book that part. That wasn't the only one. Um, so I thought even if I had the accent down, I'm still not right for the role. Uh, but, you know, I did work on Fargo with Stephanie and she preferred, unless you had that accent gold, solid, she, 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 she would say just do it without the accent. And the reason they, they, that works, everyone, the reason that can work is because if you book the part, if they like the way you look and then they like your performance, they will have the accent coach there, especially when it's that specific mm -hmm. for Fargo. You know, uh, yeah. a mutual friend, a mutual con, Dan Wilmot did mm -hmm. a couple of episodes and he booked that part. And well, you, Tim, you know Dan as well. Yeah, of course. You know, he's got a silky voice just like you. We, we had him on the show. Yes, he has a lot of voice work, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's because Dan Wilmot. <laughs> yes. Like he's in love to Velvet. He's a singer too. Yeah. yeah. Is, is, I didn't know oh, that. He karaoke's. He karaoke's. So uh, he just did it normally. And then yeah. when he was on set, they had a voice coach work with him. You know what I mean? I grew up in Thunder Bay, so I always think that accent should come easily to me, but it's so specific. Oh, you know what? Actually, I'm gonna do so I'm gonna do just totally off point. Uh, another podcast plug. Because oh. you might find this interesting. Uh, for our listening, for our listening audience here, for Tim, anyone listening, uh, listen to Canada Land. They have a an eight-part series called Thunder Bay. Oh, um, you know what? I've been told that before. Oh my and if uh, you got to listen to that and Edie, you and I should talk because we should produce a series about Thunder Bay, like a fic let's write a fiction because the crazy that happens there, it's like a port to the US. So there's all kinds of that crazy. There's indigenous, all kinds of these indigenous issues that happen in Thunder. It's a, a crazy, crazy eclectic place. Thunder Bay letter Kenny. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's we will talk about that because that's not the first time that that idea has come up for me. My dad still lives there in the house I grew up in. We got to um, write a pilot. Let's write a pilot. Oh my God, let's write a pilot. I can't play Javier anymore. I can't do two lines of Javier and two lines of Rodrigo okay. and two lines, two lines of Carlos. Latino thug, Latino thug, Latinx, Latino thug. Let's write something. Okay, before we move on from accents, I know I'm talking trash now. I'm talking trash. Before we move on from accents, two things I want to bring up and I want your opinion on, both from a casting perspective and from a business perspective. Many of our listening audience and I've, you know, many people that I've worked with and you've worked with in the past might have an accent. Usually if you're British, you can get away with just being British because everyone likes British accent. But what about if you're an English speaker, but you have a Romanian accent oh. or you're an English speaker and you have a Hindi accent or you have a, what, let's say you have an Egyptian Arabic accent. 
they focus so much on not having their accents because so many of the parts that are played will say like, hey, we want a Romanian accent or we're just looking for whatever part. But for some reason, you can't be a secretary with a Romanian accent in casting. They feel like you have to have a generic Western accent. So for example, my friend who was Romanian, you know, remember Laura, mm -hmm. Laura, she's a member of the, our actors meetup group, theactorsplace.org, theactorsplace.org meetup group, check it out. We have virtual meetups all the time. So she was Romanian and she spent years here getting, getting rid of her Romanian accent, being able to speak in her generic American accent. So she'd have that in her tool belt. But every time she auditioned for, let's say just, you know, uh, mother, secretary or lawyer, she would record it with her accent, just normally. She would talk normally. She was perfectly fluent, but she had an accent. And they were like, oh, it's, can you do it without that accent? Because people won't believe it. Because <laughs> in the world of acting, apparently, you can't have an accent and ha have a normal job. It has to define you. What are your thoughts there on this, Edie? In your um, I think that any actor in North America needs to be able to do an American accent. I said, even as Canadians, we have certain words that are triggers for Absolutely. Sounding yeah. Canadian. And they really hear them. Yeah. Yeah, they hear them. Um, I think and hope, but mostly think that that's that that is changing with the that the um, the film and television industry is changing, and that that's going to become more normal for people to. I've I've seen I've seen um, casting go out where there is no specific um, ethnicity or accent or anything. And we are seeing people of all different ethnicities and accents and stuff for that role. So I'm hoping that that changes. But at that being said, you probably, regardless of what your accent is, want to be able to do an American. And you know, it's funny because I do have many friends. Um, you know, another friend of mine recently uh, moved back to Quebec because even though she was perfectly fluent, she had a hint of a French accent. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that, that just excluded her from any type, like she couldn't play a cop, she couldn't play a lawyer. But it, it's, it's that dichotomy between what's on TV and what's in the real world. It gives me hope because you know a bit about what's going on in casting that that is changing. But man, that must be really like, we're lucky that we don't have like accents and we can very easily put on when you have a Canadian accent, it's very easy to kind of go to American. Yeah. Know? But someone who's, you know, I think French Canadians tricky because a lot of people don't recognize what it is. Mm. Uh, because it's it's so specifically it's such a specific Canadian accent. Um, however, I have discovered that a lot of people that have a bit of a French Canadian accent seem to be really good at transitioning to the Minnesota accent for Fargo. Hmm. They say a a lot. French Canadians say a. That's I don't know if that's necessarily the Fargo accent, but I notice that French Canadians when they speak English a? will say a a lot. I do you too. Know, hey, you know, uh, I'm walking down the street. I see this guy there, eh? and he come down here. <laughs> Oh, maybe, maybe more than I do. Yeah, maybe. Are you an A sayer? I, You're an A. I, I, I never, never grew up. No one around me ever said A. Like that's just that's like a Canadian stereotype. That might be the Thunder Bay thing too. I don't know. A small maybe town. It's more outside of the cities, you hear the A, the Canadian. Oh, yeah, accent. yeah. Growing up in Vancouver, there was no real Canadian accent. You know. Maybe actually, no. That were, that actually makes sense to me. We're very like close to the U.S. border, and mm -hmm. like the closest city is Seattle. Yes. Well, Thunder Bay is actually very close to Minneapolis. Half an hour. That's right. It's a. It actually is. You gotta watch this series. You gotta listen to this series. We're, we're I, right I will. Pilot, Edith. Okay, we can't talk about it. I intellectual will. property here. We gotta talk about it. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> this is something that I don't know what to feel about because Michael Shirtleff, when he writes his book, he goes really in depth into really in ideas that don't I don't think need a lot of details, and then he brushes over other ideas that I think need a lot more explanation. I'm gonna read you the entire section. Okay. An actor must interfere with his partner, his or her partner, Michael Shirtleff. A request is not a strong enough motivation for an actor. He must, he must make his needs so strong that he is willing to interfere with the other person in order to get what he needs. Try to make all your goals in terms of interfering. Interference is a demand that you be heard. Most people are so self-absorbed they won't hear you unless you insist. Interfering means getting in their way so that what you want is stronger than what they want. His or her or their. I've His been... or her. Yeah, first of all. Um, I know. I thought I had the same feeling when I read this I passage, to too. I, I was like, I think 
Because <laughs> it doesn't I think explain, because like, here's what, people are going to read this and think this, oh, I'm just going to jump all over your lines and I don't yeah. give a fuck what you do. I'm just going to do whatever I want. And if you, I'm, you know, I'm going to just push you in the middle of your lines because I think that's what I want to do. So I'm going to interfere. That's, yes. how I think, that's a dangerous thing because if you're a new actor and you do that kind of shit, you're offset. <laughs> really, especially if you're a Canadian actor with two lines yeah. on a small, on a, two lines on a small part. <laughs> and you're like, wait, hold on. What the hell is that person doing? It's this shows about me. <laughs> like, if you even, sometimes you look too much at like one yes. of the stars and be like, what the fuck are you doing? Get out of here. <laughs> um, I was, I, I had the same reaction when I read that and I was like, what? does he mean by that? And I feel like in some ways it's a little bit, um, oh gosh, you know what? My brain just went. Well, what I, what I imagined it, and I actually saw a little tongue in cheek thing that he did. Uh, I watched a documentary on Michael Shirtleff and he's, I think what he's getting at is don't passively sit there and listen to the other person's lines and then just say your own lines. I think what he's trying to say is even when that other person is doing their performance, be really present in that if your character is pacing, really pace, if you're trying to get a rise out of the other person in, in the scene, and that makes sense in the scene, have that even when you're not saying lines. The but to I anybody who went to theater school, is that like, you know how you learn to have an action? And so to make it active, what are you doing to the other person? And did you go to theater school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So did you learn this? So you had to, it sort of had to be like, what am I doing to you? And I am teasing you. I'm seducing you. I'm all the, like, all the adjectives, all yeah. of those adjectives that we had to do. I almost feel like it maybe kind of applies to that. I think so. It's, but... it's just so lame that he puts it in and that's all he says, because that means <laughs> and like, and you're like, Michael Shirtleff, that could have required a little bit more explanation because here's the <laughs> other thing here. You're going to get people who look at that and he, this is what Michael Shirtleff taught. And this is where I think he's going with it. He had a question. What happens when you're auditioning and the reader is not giving you anything? Hmm. He says, well, uh, just imagine it. Imagine that he's giving you something. And he says, like, yeah, but doesn't that put more work on me? And he says, okay, well, listen, say your, uh, uh, say your lines. And then he, this is what, this is the, oh, you could never get away with this. This is from this the 70s. The right? video that you saw? Yeah, this is from the 70s. He just grabs the girl by the neck and says, say your lines. And she says them. He says, see, look. Now you just have to pretend I did that. Hmm. And I think that's what he, when he talks about interfering is potentially doing things to get a rise out of the other actor. Maybe, I don't know. It's such a dangerous thing. It's such a fine line that I, I think he does actors a disservice by not explaining that more. I, I, I agree. Although I want to rewind to the question, isn't that more work on me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, did you not want to do any work while you were acting? Yeah. Here, let me. <laughs> yeah, it's a little more work on you. That's, the, That's what you it's not an job. easy job. And I find that when I'm when I'm working with uh, the theater students that I'm working with right now, sometimes I'm like, yeah, sorry, I know that's hard. Like, I don't have an answer for you. It's hard. These things are hard. Right now, um, with all the self taping that's going on. Um, I'm lucky that I have a daughter who's an actor and she does a lot of uh, reading for me. Um, but a few times I've had friends call in and they say, do you want to FaceTime? And I don't need them to FaceTime. I just need someone to say the words. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is more work for me because I have curtains that have butterflies on them. So I'm staring at the purple butterfly for that person and the orange butterfly for that person. <laughs> They're not as ugly as they sound. They're actually really... <laughs> oh, you know what? Actually, while you're doing this, because if you're watching the YouTube, you'll see Edie kind of changed her eye line as if she was right. talking to two people there. Okay, what, this is a very logistical auditioning question. Okay. When you have, so first of all, when you have more than two eye lines, I just keep, I just have two, that's what I do. If there's yeah. six people you're talking to, I just go back and forth between two eye lines because otherwise it's too complicated, right? Crossing the camera or keeping both eye lines on the same side of the camera? I like crossing, but if you are an actor where that is problematic and you, it throws you and you're afraid you're gonna flash the camera, it, you can put them both on the same side. But for me, it's it's more defined that it's two people and i agree with you two eye lines I, I usually say maximum three plus a throw away so two is perfect but if a door slams or someone shouts then you have your throw away eye line as well which is over there somewhere you know if you hear something or someone comes in the room mm -hmm. so you're talking to two people and someone enters then you've got your your extra eye line up there for that i like that i like that a lot mm -hmm. uh, i'll also make a note for anyone who's just listening um 
a lot of people will default to their eye line being the one that you call a throwaway, meaning the one that you're looking all the way to your left or all the way to your right. right. Yes. And you want to avoid that because then you're talking to the side of the room. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to make your eye lines as close to the camera as you can without distracting you. Fair? Yes, without, look, you, it can be so close that it, I, I sometimes I watch self tapes and I go, yes. are they down the lens or are they beside? You want to just, you don't want me asking that question. You want to be far enough off that you're not down the lens, but it's way closer than you think. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you think I'm like, no, the camera messes with spacing for sure. Yeah. If you're, if you're working with a reader, the reader should be situated beside the camera. And on that note, if you're not mic'd and you're using the camera mic, the reader should then be quiet because mm -hmm. they they will be a lot louder. So what I've been doing with doing a lot of self taping is, um, I don't have a daughter that I know of. So I call <laughs> friends up and I make, uh, I mean, I may, who knows? Nineties were a crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> the nineties were a crazy time. That's right. If I went um, home with less than three hundred dollars in tips at the end of the night, I you know, I you know. So, <laughs> uh, break the restaurant. I just mean the nineties were a crazy time. Dude. People were going out, spending money, having spending fun. Money, so, speaking of going, no one goes out, right? So, I've been doing a lot of my auditioning with friends, and I've been putting my laptop beside my. I have a little ring light with a phone holder. So I put my laptop beside the phone and then I've just kind of learned to keep a good volume so that you can sort of hear the reader, but they're not mm -hmm. louder than me. And that's been my go-to uh, with my ring light. Mm -hmm. you gotta that find sounds like a good setup. Yeah, it's it's fine um, because I did have that trap where once I did record something and I had the full volume on my computer and the person was on Skype and they were just so loud that I had to go in and- We do, we talk loudly on Skype or on- what are we on right now? We're, we're on Zoom. Because we, we're, we, you, it feels far away. So you want to... Hi, Ivan. <laughs> yeah. You hey. like, sometimes I'll be on for like 10 minutes and be like, I am shouting. You know, I've been shouting for the last 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. And so be aware of that, actors. Um, I, I put what my default is. I keep it just above halfway on my computer volume. So my that person I find is enough. That's enough yes. to be heard from the phone camera or what have you. All right, let's jump into this next part. Again, it's like he's running out of things to say. So this is a title and the chapter and the and it's three sentences. So the success of a scene is predicted on the amount of need. And he already talked about need and desire and objective, but then he just feels the need to write this. Your needs must be strong enough so that you will insist that the other person deal with and take care of your problem. Remember the opposite. You will take care of their problem. Take and give. And that's it. I mean, it sounds like good stuff, but as an actor, how would you apply that? I would go back to the same thing we talked about before with the action words. Like, I, I think that's what it is. And and I... Like, I when she says action words, everyone, she's like, every single line, you reduce it down to um, an adjective. Is it, you know, I want, I give, I take, I adore, I seduce, like those things. Yeah, right? yeah. Although it's, we had to do that in theater school. We had to do every single line and I found that impossible. Like you, there's no way you can jump the mental gymnastics of going on this line, I'm doing this and then I'm doing this and then I'm doing this. Like it's enough. I think they do that for actors to kind of build the muscle, no? Yes, yeah, for I sure. Trap, like how can, like you'd be, you'd be Nicolas Cage emotional roller coaster. Like I mean, <laughs> Nicolas Cage can do that and get away it, with it. I mean, you want to decide three or four things that you want from the person and how you're going to get them maybe, but I don't know, I don't know if you want to do 20 different things that you want and how you're going to get them. But that's that's what it feels like. It, it, and I think anything that can make a scene active and energetic, which it sounds like what he's looking for there is, I, I find when I see actors, there was such a style of acting to make everything so small and so nothing for so long. And I feel like sometimes I just want to go, just give them a little push, just bump up that energy just a little so that, that I feel like you care that you're there. And that's it, everybody. Part one of Edie Inksender's discussion on The Lazy Actor. A big thank you to RadioRadio.com. Make sure to check them out for all your podcast or voice work needs. And to the actorsplace.org. We just published a brand new blog post about how to contact casting directors. So check them out. TheActorsPlace.org, RadioRadio.com. And that's it for part one with Edie Inksender of The Lazy Actor. See you next time.